Okay, what you're looking at is the book of John, chapter 6, verses 44 and 45. This is amazing. This is perfect confirmation for exactly what I described and how I described it in telling you as best I could that all souls are saved, all souls are drawn unto God and at that point any that have not found God will find him then and that I said as they're being drawn to the halls of a spirit righteous judgment that's what a righteous judgment truly implies that the father has foreknown knowledge that they have been deceived that they have been led astray and that this flock has strayed unintentionally. The deceiver has lured the apple before their face. And that would even go before the donkey and the wild asses. Think about that. Look at how all this works. I just, I'm thinking about this as, as it comes on the spot. You think about the donkey that has the stick above its head with the apple dangling from it that's used to make the donkey pull the cart. Wow. Now, who are the donkeys? They're the Don Keys. Those are the sons of God. The Don Keys are the Nod Keys, the land of Nod from Genesis, where Cain goes and takes a wife. This descendancy, which is relative to Enoch, and then we know that the book of Enoch and Enoch himself is now in the midst of these giants. Well, that's the land of Nod. So the Nod Keys, the Don Keys, have had the same temptation, the same apple held before them. That's how the fractal works. That's how the spirit of truth works. You're being, and I'm being taught, I'm being shown with the things that we've been shown as a little child. The truth is encoded in that. So I'm showing you that all flesh, because these sons of God, the original plan was to bring them back into the flesh. So they are written into the book of life. But there is a question for their descendancy, which would be the Nephilim, because the Nephilim were never supposed to be. So this demigod descendancy, there's a question. They have not been written into the book of life, so the Bible considers them subject to this judgment, okay, which is going to still be a spirit righteous judgment, but we won't talk about at least that perspective now, but the Bible does talk about it. But the perspective that I want to talk about is the description of all flesh that shall be saved. And that in trying to describe that even after these people have died, they did not believe in Jesus. Okay. They did not believe, just like we see here, chapter 12, the book of John. Okay. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I come not to judge the world, but to save the world. Why is Jesus coming to save the world? Because the caretakers of the world, the previous caretakers, the high spirit sons have rebelled and they have led this world into destruction. So therefore, mankind is not responsible. Now, mankind himself can become aware, know Jesus Christ, and then turn from Jesus Christ and then become iniquitous. So if he becomes iniquitous and rejects God, yes, he's in the crosshairs of annihilation. Absolutely. Because you cannot reject the very thing that holds you up. You can't, the creation cannot reject the designer. It's an impossibility. It's an abomination. Because if the creation rejects the designer, the creation therefore has no purpose to exist and therefore will become extinct. It's pointless. It's void. It's empty because the creation is only a product of the hopes, the dreams, the intent of the creator. And if the creation rejects that, it rejects its own identity. It rejects its original estate. It rejects its original plan. It rejects its original dominion. It rejects its original creation, and that's exactly what they've done. That's what they've done, because they were impatient. They wanted now what would have naturally come to them in eternity, 
They had to serve a service for the universe, serve a service for the evolving mortals of the universe, which were, which we are of, and they have failed at that task miserably. So as we see here, Jesus Christ is not going to judge anyone harshly. He's going to judge you righteously, and he's going to bring you to the shores of eternity. But at that moment, it will be up to you once you recognize Jesus Christ, once you recognize the reality of the spiritual abode, once you see the angels of the Lord all around you, the spirit, true spirit beings, once you see them all around you, guess what? You fall to your knees and you repent. And you don't repent in such a way of guilt or shame. You repent in such a way of sheer joy and love that yes, it was somehow true that love was righteous and it was sufficient to bring you through. And it did. And it did. And that we don't have a cruel father and that in a sense you will be given a second chance. That second chance is once you're awoken on the other side at the point of judgment as you meet the maker, Jesus Christ. Then friend, you know he's real. And that's exactly where, what we're going to see described. <laughs> exactly. And that's the beautiful thing about it. Remember what we saw in the book of John, uh, chapter 17. Okay. And we see that the father has given him all flesh, all flesh. He's not going to lose a single one. And then you saw in the Old Testament, the same testament of spirit of truth declaring all souls were his. And then to further clarify, just once again, it's all of mankind that has ever lived. All of those written into the book of life, which is the original life plan projection that could be connected to the material DNA. And it is. But there's also a spiritual book of life in which the angels of heaven who also know the very hairs of your head, every last single one of them, to the exact second they sprout and fall off your body. And that's a fact. And we can explain that further through the understanding of your own vibratory magnetic field, which what some people would call your aura that surrounds you. It's the very same thing that surrounds a planet. There's a, in a sense, a, uh, for lack of a better term, a mild energy discharge, an unseen energy field, an unseen energy equation, which is surrounding your vessel. And that's known as an aura. It's the very same thing that surrounds the planet, but along the lines of a different magnitude and along the lines of a different repercussion. But I would say the job duty is the same and that's orientation that's balance that's uh preceptibility it's order it's cognizance it's consciousness it's it's all of the things of being a part of what you're created from just as mankind was created from the dust of the earth he has that same the dust of the earth is the potential for the creation of man and that spark of life being breathed into it is what sparked the evolution of mankind itself evolving from a single cell organism all the way to the fullness of that potential mankind. And that's why it says, let the earth bring forth every animal after his kind. And then you see that when it comes to the creation of man, it's the same thing. It's the earth that brings the forth the dust of the earth, but yet the spark is supplied by the spirit. And we would recognize that spark as the seal, which is also recognized as the Holy Ghost in the Bible. And that seal, which you are now seeing, is the tetrahedron, which is also known as the Star of David, which you are equating in some way to sacred geometry, in which now you're beginning to find out why that geometry is sacred. Because it's the life pattern. It's the understanding of the design of creation. It's the maker's mark, if you will. And they're going to try to contort it and make it seem like something that it's not. And because it's a six-pointed star, but that's in the 2D interpretation. 
That's a 2D observation as a sign and a symbol. And it is relative because that geometry is relative to a type of reality, a type of reality perspective that can be achieved, which would be synonymous with what's known as the sixth sense. So the sixth sense is absolutely relative to the seal of the living God that's on the foreheads of those that can't be harmed by the locust. Well, you've got a sixth sense. You've got the living God seeing for you that can tell you the doctrine of these locusts is false. The identity of these locusts is false. We've already revealed them as the descendancy of the symbolic Danites, which is sim symbolically represents DNA. In other words, these ancient descendancy of the mighty men, the Nephilim, the offspring of the sons of God with the daughters of men. Okay. So, wow, there's so much to understand and know, but what I want you to know is that it's all one thing. This world's history is connected to a singular event, and then it has just been one cause and effect that has been relative to the cause and the effect before it that can be traced back to the original event and then the original event, the repercussion is still being found in the echo of our reality. Now for this reality, the original event would be the Garden of Eden connection and that's the temptation of man, um, that's the sin, that's this relative symbol of the apple that we can see even the sons of God themselves were tempted with. And it's described in Ezekiel chapter 19 that that's exactly what happened. Exactly what happened. All right, so now you understand absolutely all men, the Father's given them to him. It's relative to the power, the almightiness, the intent, the will of the absolute Father, the word that Jesus Christ lived. Now here's our confirmation. Here's our confirmation. This is uh, chapter 6. I'm telling you, this is perfect confirmation. This is, uh, you know, this is what the good news is, guys. I didn't know about, I didn't know about these verses here. I, uh, I might have heard them quoted before by somebody else out of context, of course, absolutely. Not in the context that we're going to quote them right here. We're going to quote them in the correct context, as you're going to see. So... Let me just tell you what you're going to see explained here. It's going to describe the scene that I'm telling you that in the afterlife, that once you see Jesus, you're going to turn and that you're going to be taught of God. And then once you do, you are going to find God. You're going to be drawn to God. And this is taking place after the resurrection. This is going to be relative to these ones that did not believe in him to the fullness and you're going to see as this is being talked about now it's also relative to those that do believe in him but the point is is that all souls are him all souls are his all souls all flesh is, is his all souls are going to be drawn to him through the power of the father which has already ordained this to happen there's no way to stop it there's no way to stop it. So the beauty of this, what you'll see, is it's going to describe these, these people that have rejected, rejected God and that are going to have no way to reject Him any longer. Because to be in the very presence of your Creator is to be showered in love to be showered in glory. And don't think about love and glory in the descriptive of how you see it and materialize. Nah, it's, it's something that I don't have the ability to explain to you. It's something that we probably can only grasp by just knowing that it's something much more supreme than what our highest ideal of it could possibly be. That it's much more supreme than even that. And it will be. And don't before we go ahead and start reading this, which is going to confirm all of the things that we talked about in the other video, right here in Jesus' own words, stuff that we didn't read last night. This is chapter 6 of the book of John. Um, and don't take me wrong here, because there are, the wages of sin is death. But who is paying these wages? Well, 
Sin is, the moon god. And false Israel is using this symbolic moon god to wage this wrath. And I've showed it to you, my John. When they commit the second cup, their bombs come from the moon. And that's a quite fitting because the wrath is coming symbolically in the Bible from Yahweh, this God of both light and shadow, good and evil. You know, has the ability to love Israel, but murder Gentiles, men, women, children, condone and ordain rape. I mean, you've got to wake up and you got to see that Jesus was doing his best in a very dangerous conditional climate at the time where he was trying to literally move amongst the lost sheep of Israel as one of them and free them with the word and they rejected him and they put him on the cross these men killed him it wasn't something that the father ordained it was something they ordained but Jesus fulfilled the word of the father which was to love men as yourself to love to God love God with all your might and the, that's the fulfillment of the cross. As I, and we all know, Jesus obliged. He obliged for the will of those to be able to live, that we're going to be able to proclaim the gospel as a result of them finally capturing Jesus. And then he got up on the cross for those that wanted him there. And he died. He called his enemy. They were his enemy. He said, call your enemy, your friend. And he said, there is no greater love a man can give than to give his life for his friend. False Israel was Jesus' friend, even though they were his enemy, and he gave his life even for them. That's incredible. And, and thank you to the Spirit of Truth for allowing me to see that as I even said it. Even said it. Because that's what the Spirit was trying to correct me on last night. You know, that when I said, when I said uh, that false Israel were the would-be righteous, and then the Spirit corrected me and said, yeah, they are the would-be righteous, but they are also the lost sheep. And since then, I've found the words of Jesus saying, go unto the lost sheep of Israel. You can look that right up in your Strong's Concordance. Go unto the lost sheep of Israel. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He fulfilled himself within the lost sheep of Israel. Incredible, incredible. So they were the would-be righteous, um, but at the same time, they try to make him the would-be righteous. And that's what I was trying to say the other night, that they, they saw Jesus as a militant redeemer that would be born from the descendancy of David. And you can even see Jesus Christ question them that how if I'm born of the descendancy of David, does David call me Lord? Because they want to put David before Jesus and only claim the descendancy that Jesus has is by the might of David and the forefathers before him, their own lineage. Jesus is saying, nah. He's saying the might that I have is of the Father. Anyway, I hope you've read this right here and understand so far what it means. I'll be right back. <laughs> 